stream if everybody else is comfortable. Um, so here we are. Um, Communities in Play Overview and Scrutiny Committee on the 1st of December. Um, it's 10 a.m. Uh, I'm the new chair, uh, Jeff Reed. Um, I was here, I, was, I did four years in the previous administration, so I'm not new to this. Um, so hopefully we shall have an enjoyable time together over the next four years, or, or however, long, however long it lasts. So we shall start with the first item on the agenda, which is the membership of the committee, which, as you can see, it has changed. Welcome Richard Dodd, who seems to follow me around from committee to committee these days. And well, neither do I, Richard. <laughs> and the second item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies? None received, Chair. OK. Thank you. Mark, Mark Muir does as well. So he is, but we don't have apologies from him. Maybe... I'll, put them, I'll, put them I'll put them in. I'll put them in. Yeah, probably. Yeah. He's probably busy. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the disclosure of members interest, we all know um, we, what we've declared. Is there anything other than the things we've already declared anyone else wants to add? It doesn't look like it. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting, um, you're going to have to... Somebody... That was there is going to have to propose and second them because I wasn't. There we are. We have two members. Um, I think it's two sets of members. Yeah. And that for this, both for the same. Yeah, we're happy with that. Um, so the next thing is the forward plan. Um, yeah, did you want to comment on this, just Sean? Just, you yeah, need to just, put your microphone on. Yeah, I mean, just, just briefly, Chair, uh, the, the four plan, this is the four plan of, of key cabinet decisions, and, and the purpose of circulating it is to um, give members the opportunity to, to, to look at the reports before they are considered by cabinet. And there's only, there's only the one that affects the, this committee, and that's the destination management report, which is actually on today's agenda, so there's, there's nothing to add to that. Excellent, thank you. Um, so we will now um, go on to the, the meat of the meeting, which is the, the scrutiny of the reports we have before us. Um, I've been asked to move things round slightly because um, Greg has quite a bit on at the moment. <laughs> so we're, we're, going to, we're going to do his first and then we shall go back to the active travel plan and then um, the other things we have to do. So Greg, fire away. Okay, thanks, Chair, and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Greg Gavin, as, and I'm the head of Neighbourhood Services. I think committee thought that it would be uh, useful that uh, local services come and, and present to, to new members and, and members that uh, perhaps are more used to, uh, to dealing with neighbourhood services and tech services. Uh, just to give you a feel for what the services are that we're providing, and to give members of the committee an opportunity to perhaps think about things that they may want to call in scrutiny in the future and uh, learn a little bit more about. So this uh, presentation is for the neighbourhood services half of local services, Paul Jones and or David Lorks. I think we'll come to a future meeting and talk about technical services, which effectively is highways and, and some of the things. So I won't touch on highways issues today and I'll, I'll focus on neighbourhood services, which, uh, which I'm responsible for. Um, so the intention today is to talk you through our key areas of responsibility so you know what the services are that sit within neighbourhood services. Um, to just briefly explain to you what staffing and, and other resources we deploy to achieve all of those services. Um, give you a sort of bit of a who's who in terms of who the management team is, so who the, who the key contacts are, but then how to make contact with us for more routine service inquiries. Uh, and then to talk a little bit as well about what our key priorities are in our service plan or in our draft service plan for the next few years and what some of our key challenges are going to be over the next few years as well so you can get a feel for the things that are you know particularly uh, demanding our attention at the moment and, and sort of taking up our thoughts so in, in terms of a purpose uh, the, the purpose of all the services within neighborhood services is to work together with local communities and other key stakeholders to improve the physical appearance and, and quality of life within communities and I think it is that, you know, physical appearance that is 
important. That's what we do. We, we maintain and we improve the physical appearance of the county, specifically on the soft landscaping side of things. So the, the hard landscaping, the highways is, is David Lorks' side of the, the service in tech services. But the, re the really important thing in that sort of statement of purpose is that it's doing that not on our own, but it is doing that in conjunction with communities and other stakeholders. And obviously elected members are, you know, key stakeholder within the work that we do. Um, so probably the, the biggest component of neighbourhood services in, in terms of um, the way that it touches all, all residents in the county is our refuse collection and, and recycling collection services. So it's probably unique in the council, in, apart from council tax probably, in, in that it touches every single household and certainly unique in terms of it touches every single household every single week. Um, so we collect um, on an alternate weekly cycle of dry recycling materials one week and then residual general waste uh, the next and uh, apologies that's uh, notifications which i should have turned off before this it's um, so with, within the waste service other services that um, that we provide apart from those two alternate weekly collections is we offer a, a an optional garden waste service or so a chargeable service uh, to most of the county not all of the county uh, we offer a trade waste service across the whole county and, uh, and that's something that we've grown quite successfully over, over the last few years to bring more income in. To Is this oh, it's working? A heavily discounted hazardous waste service for residents that perhaps need to get rid of a, an asbestos um, You've just gone quiet, Greg. Um, I think the microphone turned itself off. Yeah, yeah that's all right. We're, we're about to get you a replacement. <laughs> it wasn't me, was it? No, no, it wasn't you. It wasn't you at all. Uh, and thanks, thanks for that. Okay, usually when it comes to technology, it is my fault, so it's pleasing that that wasn't for a change. Um, so, so, yeah, so the other services within our waste service, trade waste, garden waste, and then the hazardous waste is, is where residents can contact us for uh, some assistance with getting rid of, you know, nasty stuff like asbestos and chemicals. And then we run a bulky waste service where we, uh, for, a check, for a fee, we'll remove bulky waste from people's um, premises. Now the technology is not working again, but this is my oh, no. okay. So within the refuse service, we uh, we operate twelve household waste recovery centres. So uh, this is where residents can take excess waste uh, or excess recycling materials that they can't fit into their wheelie bins or that they don't want to arrange a bulky waste collection for. Four of those sites are more rural and, and open four days a week, and that is uh, Thursday. Sorry, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, when people need them the most. But our biggest eight sites are open seven days a week and uh, take in an awful lot of, uh, of waste. So we have around 45,000 tonnes of waste that go through those 12 sites every year. Um, of, of those tonnes, we recycle a decent amount. We recycle, um, usually it's above 70%, but last, in the last couple of years, because of COVID and some of the changes we've had to introduce, that's dipped a little bit, but 68% is, is still a, a high recycling rate for those sites. And we do get some really good customer feedback. Um, we were one of the first authorities after the initial lockdown in COVID as well to reopen our sites and, uh, and I think they are well respected by, by the community. In, in terms of what we do with all of that rubbish and all of that recycler that we collect um, is, a, is a massive undertaking and a massive operation all in its own right and to process all of that material we have a 28 year um, waste PFI contract and that brought in a significant amount of investment at the time to uh, to the county in terms of upgrading those 12 household waste sites, but also building a bespoke material recycling facility where we can process all our recycling waste and uh, buy in effectively a, a third line of an energy from waste plant to, uh, to dispose of all of our residual waste so that we don't have to send it to landfill. Um, so that contract also includes transfer stations in terms of where the crews tip off 
um, that energy from waste plant and access to other contracts in terms of um, composting our garden waste collections and, and the like. It's making a sound, but it's not changing slides. Okay, just make sure it hasn't skipped one. Uh, so managing the council's fleet also sits within uh, neighbourhood services. So the, the county council has over 700 vehicles, um, ranging from uh, cars to uh, to big refuse collection vehicles, um, and you know over a thousand items of, of plant and equipment. Now, for all of the vehicles that the council operate that uh, that are above three and a half ton in vehicle, gross vehicle weight, uh, we've got a legal requirement to hold a operator's license. So we, as a service, are the council's holder of a um, of the operator's license and all of the legal compliance around not a lot overloading vehicles not allowing drivers to work too many hours and, and the like that all sits within neighborhood services so we keep on top of that for, for all service areas really uh, we maintain all of our own fleet uh, through four vehicle workshops there are a small number of vehicles up in the berwick area which we uh, contract the maintenance of that out but almost all of that fleet is maintained in-house and we also have the responsibility for replacing that fleet on a rolling cycle so the council invests in a fleet replacement program uh, and we manage the procurement activity in in conjunction with colleagues from procurement uh, and all the other bits and bobs that we uh, we do to manage the fleet there as well still Button's not working. Uh, so within our countryside service, I've got two uh, slides here, and, uh, and and in hindsight now, there's a there's a glaring omission because I haven't got tree and woodland management on my slides. Now, as you can imagine, um, that's a busy area of activity normally, but uh, but certainly over the last uh, few days, it's been uh, been a significant part of the work that we do. But. But we maintain over 3,000 kilometres of, um, or miles rather, of rights of way uh, throughout the county. So making sure they're all free and accessible for people um, is, is down to us. Uh, so once we've got on top of all of the highways and parks stuff in terms of the, the damage from Storm Arwen, we'll, we'll then have thousands of miles of rights of way to try and make sure it's clear as well. So that uh, that will come in, in the next phase. Um, we manage a number of parks and, and green spaces throughout the county from um, our big country parks like the Druish Bay and Bolham Lake uh, to some of our more urban parks um, like I think the ones on the picture there we've got the water the new water play at um, in Ashington at the Hurst where we've we've had a multi-million pound um, investment through the heritage, heritage lottery in the last couple of years uh, there's Carlisle Park there in, in Morpeth, and then you've, you've got Bolham Lake mm -hmm. and, uh, and Druridge Bay, uh, where we've, uh, we've invested a bit of money as well in the last few years to make sure that's a, a high quality space that people can go and exercise and, uh, and enjoy the countryside. It's obviously been even more important for people during, uh, during COVID and, and lockdown. Uh, we, we then do all of the really grubby, horrible stuff to try and make sure that, uh, you know, places aren't grubby and horrible. So we deal with all of the fly tipping, uh, all of the litter, the graffiti issues that, uh, that we get in the county uh, and we maintain public conveniences as well. So um, alongside the street cleansing operation, it sits the grounds maintenance operation. So we try and integrate those services as, as much as possible. Um, but all of the sort of amenity grass cutting and the highway verge cutting in the county is, is done by neighbourhood services and it, now this time of year in the winter we're maintaining hedges and we're maintaining shrubs and doing some path edging and, and the like to try and make sure that we're ready for the, for the next cutting season. Button's still not working. Um, perhaps uh, a slight sort of a different service that sits within neighbourhood services is the county's nine markets. So with our neighbourhood services teams, we sort of integrate the management of those. So we've got staff that are managing um, frontline grounds and street cleansing services also help support uh, the one markets officer that we've got in the county to try and 
um, make sure that we've got thriving markets and, and that has been even more of a challenge than normal. That is a declining market, for the want of a better word, um, across the country. The same as retail, you know, it's high streets are suffering uh, and the impact of COVID as well. That's That's been interesting. But, but some traders have been a lifeline for communities in that initial phase of lockdown where we were allowed them to continue, you know, trading fruit and veg and, and the likes of people were able to get out and not have to go to a supermarket and be in the outside uh, which has been helpful. Uh, we also manage all of the county council cemeteries and the crematorium at Blythe. Um, so making sure that uh, with colleagues in uh, registrars that we provide an end-to-end -end, uh, compassionate service for people, you know, when they're at their sort of lowest ebb and they, they need support and help in arranging burials or, or cremations. So our teams uh, do, uh, do all of that as, as well. Um, and I think hopefully you'll appreciate that's a lot of stuff and sorry if it's taken a while to get through but but that isn't even sort of everything that we do but they are the key things that we do apart from the mission that I said in terms of uh, tree and woodland management now in terms of what that costs the county council to, to deliver is uh, we, we have a budget uh, of just over 30 million pounds so 32 million pounds we are, we spend um, sort of the best part of fifty five million pounds in undertaking all of that activity and managing our waste and, and everything else. But then, from internal customers and external customers, we bring back in twenty three million pounds worth of income through that those services as well. So uh, so we spend a lot. We get a lot back in. Some of it from outside of the council. Uh, so the commercial waste that I mentioned earlier, we bring in best part of two million pounds now. Um, from commercial waste customers from the private sector to, to support our bottom line. Um, and then in terms of sort of who we are uh, as, as a management team, so sitting uh, above myself as the director of local services, we've got Paul Jones, which many of you will know. Our latest interim exec director is in the room, uh, Rob Murphy. So, uh, so local services have been aligned with planning at the moment and Rob's our interim exec director. Uh, and then you've got me as head of neighborhood services and, and David Lorks as, as head of technical services. Um, so my, my direct management team are uh, Stephen Wardle, who looks after the countryside, the NEAT and the, the waste area managers who, who are on the next slide. Uh, we've got Colin Curtis, who manages all of those waste contracts that we were talking about earlier and gives us uh, some advice on commercialisation as well in, in terms of our trade waste. We've got Davy Robertson, who manage, procures and manages all of the council's fleet. And then we've got Nicola Wardle, who is our business and customer support team leader, and her teams are like the depot admin teams, as well as a very small team in County Hall that support both neighbourhood services and, and local services. So in terms of members' interactions with, um, with neighbourhood service personnel, Typically, that's through the, uh, the, the area-based teams or the countryside teams. So we've got there the, uh, the five area managers, which most of you will uh, know and have had contact with. We've got Bob Hodgson, who manages the North Northumberland area. Uh, Paul Lowe's manages Castle Morpeth, Ray Whelan's for Ashton and Blythe. And then you've got Tony Gribbin, who manages the Crumlington, Bedlington and Seaton Valley local area. Uh, and David Hunt on, on the Tyndale side. And then we've got Neil Dawson, who's our Senior Countryside and Green Spaces Officer, and some members in the room may have uh, perhaps had more experience with Mike Jeffrey in the past. So effectively, uh, Neil is, is picking up a lot of Mike's old responsibilities, so looks after parks, open spaces, trees and woodland, and, and writes away for us. Okay, last couple of slides now, and, uh, and we'll move through. So in terms of our sort of key challenges, priorities, and, and they overlap, uh, for the next few years. Probably the, the biggest one will be enhancing the curbside recycling arrangements that are in place at the moment. <laughs> so the government's environment bill went through um, Parliament 
uh, and we're still awaiting all of the details that flow from that, but we're pretty confident that that will mandate a, a new set of statutory services for local authorities. So we'll be expected to collect a m much wider range of materials at the doorstep for people. So that is likely, well, it almost definitely will include uh, glass waste collections from the curbside, which we're running a pilot scheme and just extended a pilot scheme on at the moment. It will um, include collecting food waste from every household in the county um, and it may include um, making it mandatory to collect garden waste from all properties you know irrespective of, of rurality as well and there'll be a lot of other materials that have probably come online as well in terms of films and tetra packs and, and the like but the detail on that is, is still to come but that will be a huge piece of work uh, as will the uh, changes to our waste PFI contract to uh, to accommodate all of that. Um, one thing that continues to, to be a priority for us is, is collaboration, working in partnership with town and parish councils to improve local environmental quality, uh, engaging volunteers, supporting community groups to help improve their local area and their local public open spaces. You know, we genuinely we can't do it on our own. We, we do look to volunteers to help as much as possible. Unfortunately, there are a lot of good ones um, in the county. Um, Priorities for fleet management are about greening the fleet as much as possible. Given the scope of our services, we can have a huge impact on, on the council's aspirations in terms of climate change. So we want to play our part in, in that regard. Um, but one of the challenges for us in all vehicle types is getting new vehicles in uh, on the fleet replacement programme. So we've had semiconductor issues, we've had price of steel going up 85%, we've had Brexit, we've had every excuse in the world thrown at us for why the vehicles aren't arriving on time. But more and more, um, you know, vehicles are several months later than the original um, target date when we, uh, when we finally get them. Um, so in terms of housing growth in the county, uh, which is probably good overall for the economy of the county, uh, but the impact that has on our refuse and recycling crews, as well as our street cleansing and grounds crews, uh, is significant because as soon as a new house comes online, you know, they want a fortnightly collection of residual waste, they want a fortnightly collection of, of uh, you know, all of their materials and, and that puts a significant strain on the uh, on the service given the thousands of houses that are being built. Um, recruiting and training and retaining staff is a challenge for us, especially HGV drivers and workshop fitters. They're two um, areas that we're currently struggling to recruit to, uh, a national shortage of HGV drivers, as, as you'll be aware. Uh, and then we're looking at a whole range of sort of modernisation um, initiatives at the minute in terms of digitising services, looking at the functionality of, uh, you know, different sort of processes and, and ways that we can uh, monitor and improve productivity, but also that uh, we can improve the feedback to customers when they report an issue, because uh, that is a bit of a missing link at the minute in terms of some of the systems that we have. Um, and then climate change, making sure we baseline the carbon footprint of our sort of waste services and, and other services and minimising the impact that frontline services have on that agenda in terms of reviewing the equipment that we use, fuel types and maintenance schedules that we uh, that we deliver for grounds maintenance would be another example of that that we'll be reviewing. Um, and then in terms of our countryside and green spaces service, one of the key issues that was already on our agenda was to review the tree and woodland strategy uh, this year um, and to deliver the parks improvement program uh, looking at increasing the maintenance of, of rights away and, uh, and there'll be a lot of reactive stuff to do in that space obviously following um, Storm Arwen. In terms of reporting day-to-day -day issues, so your local issues of my neighbour's not had their bin emptied or there's broken glass on the pavement, we would ask you to use the council's normal um, channels and uh, you've all had a copy of these slides and there's some, some links on there in terms of how you do that. Um, but in terms of making contact with individual area managers or officers that are responsible for your patch, there's also a link in this to the local services right. who's who document and it gives you more detailed structure charts and, and contact details than the ones that I've put up so breaking it down to, to an area level and I think chair that was it excellent um, <clears throat> so questions for Greg councillor Castle 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one about markets. I was curious. Uh, is it a loss maker? And if so, how much do we lose from market operations? Okay. Leading up to the first lockdown, uh, we've gone through the last four or five years from making a small surplus to it about breaking even. Councillor, um, during the lockdown, we've had losses, but we've had to close the markets and, and change the way that we do things. Um, so, so at the <laughs> moment in time, it's a loss maker because of the impact of, of COVID. Uh, we're hoping to get back to it about breaking even, um, and we're making some progress towards that. Thank you. Breaking even sounds good. Yep. Anyone else? Councillor Gallagher. Um, thank you, Chair, and Greg, thank you very much for uh, the, the overview, which BSLA is an update probably for more of the new members than the older ones. But before I, I go into searching questions, I just want to make it on record again. I want to thank you and your staff, not only for what you've done through COVID, but also through the recent bad weather as well, because bins are still being emptied, the place is trying to be maintained, and we, as elected members, understand that. And sometimes it's just got to be said that that's a, a, a piece of work that's been done. And, and Joe Public out there just expects that the bins are going to be finished and emptied. Um, but we understand the, the, the obstacles you've been under. Um, Ray Whelan's at Stake Ford, I know that's his paramount uh, drive to make with his background as well to get them done. So uh, well done on that. So thank you very much. Um, if it's okay, can I just go through your presentation and um, just ask a few... Um, so long as it's not the whole thing, Brian. No, no, I'll go through very, very quickly. I'm sorry. Um, the refuge collection and the recycling, you know, I'm just wondering, you know, you said we've got external income coming in. Uh, on, are we improving on that year on year? And, you know, and is there anything better helping with the, with the bulky waste? Because that still is a bit of a tedious thing to go through for, for public. Um, the disposal sites, access seems to be a big problem as well. Um, I can only speak for the, the North Seaton one in Ashington. We've got a lot of cars parked at the side. And not only that was a problem in the past, but now we've got cars that are advertised for sale by the local traders. Um, so I'm sure they'll not all be taxed, MOT and insured. So we need them accesses opened up, uh, and I don't know if you could have a word with enforcement <coughs> about that. Um, and maybe the idea is, I've been to, to the tip, like many people, maybe setting up some sort of a, a, a traffic like system up there, because we're having to take a man away from that service to, to escort cars in. So it's maybe just an idea. Um, totally understand about your fleet management. Um, the rates of way is an ongoing monster in itself. Uh, parks and uh, green spaces, what I would like to do, and if possible, um, open up routes of information. So I've done it in the past where I've um, had concerns and I've gotten in contact with those officers and, and I still don't know if they're doing or not unless I go down. So we just need that feedback. Uh, you know, it's, it's sweeping up after you. Basically, uh, just get back to elected members or highlight to elected members is if there's an issue, because I was born in the Riverside Park and I don't know without going down there if it's been fixed. Um, maybe an update for new members and myself around where the public conveniences are. Um, ground maintenance is in itself, you know, we're, I'm sure everybody keeps an eye on that. And I'm pleased that you brought up the partnerships with the the town and parish councils, because that's something to bring on board as well. Um, the markets, I would like to try and come back to the markets, because I think as we've dealt with markets over the 10, 15 years, it's, it's a shift in months that's changed now. The, the high street's changed, whereas the market was a benefit to the high street. Now it's, it's, it's an Achilles heel to the high street. So we never had pound lands and the, the cheaper shops on the high streets. They're struggling now. So, you know, if somebody's trading for six days a week and one day that's a market and we've got a pound land, we should be trying to protect them a little bit more because, let's face it, they're paying Northumberland County Council rates. And I think a review of what should be on that market and, the you know, a farmer's market, 
and maybe have people that are local to the area to help them go through it. Uh, the benefit service, um, I've just recently lost my mother-in-law, went through this particular uh, thing. And again, I want to say thank you very much because the registrars don't get thanked enough. They were very caring. And it, and it was a big reassurance for me and my family to go through that. So we could get some mention back there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Um, I, do you want to come back on any of that, Greg? Um, I, I think there are a couple of questions in there that I, I, I'll answer and, uh, and a couple of comments probably to, to come back on. Yeah, uh, well, I suppose thank you for the thank you in the first instance, uh, Councillor. The, uh, the, the teams that we employ, uh, employ are, are good, you know, almost all of the time. They've been exceptional during COVID and, and then in, in recent times, and they really do step up to the mark when, when there is a crisis of some sort. So it's, uh, I'll make sure that gets fed back to the teams. Thank you. Uh, in terms of commercial waste income uh, and whether we've grown that year on year, yes, we have. So in the last five years, we've grown it from £1.1 million worth of income to we're knocking on the door of £2 million worth of external income now. Um, in fact, we've perhaps exceeded that. The, the last time I looked, it was 1.9 something or other. So yeah, we've significantly grown, grown that. Um, in terms of the disposal lights and the parking issues, yes, I'll, I'll take that to back in but in terms of access and, and traffic lights we did have restrictions on the number of vehicles in for covid controls we have rolled some of those back now um so that hopefully there will be less of an issue with with queuing going forward but i'll take that as a suggestion to the team um in terms of public conveniences and where we are um, at the moment, during the uh, the pandemic, we've significantly increased the cleansing of those facilities on a temporary basis. Um, so we've gone from one cleanse a day, which is the standard service that, that we deliver to cleaning all facilities uh, three times a day, seven days a week, which is a significant undertaking and, and a significant additional COVID cost. Uh, but it is worth just reminding people that is a temporary arrangement at some point we will have to go back to our standard uh, level of service which people will notice because it's been significantly enhanced for hygiene reasons we've got a million pounds improvement budget um, for toilets over the next two or three years uh, so we have already um, had a significant refurb on sea houses toilets we're part way through one on the main facility in Holy Island um, that unfortunately contracts <laughs> went up to belly up so that's been a bit delayed but we are now we've got a schedule and a new contractor uh, so we, we're back on with that but we're also then looking at some of the main other main tourism facilities and the other main town centre facilities for proper refurbishments of those facilities and all of the remaining facilities that aren't then on that refurbishment list will get all of the backlog maintenance undertaken and some accessibility improvements so there's a lot of work going to be going on in that space in, in the next uh, few years um, and, and then the comment on, on markets councillors in terms of reviewing I think and bringing back to this meeting that's absolutely fine in, in terms of the comments around protecting retailers there's sometimes two different perspectives on that most retailers would agree that on market days even if some of those market stores are in direct competition with them that their footfall is higher on market day than any other day. Um, so the, there's benefits as well as potential conflicts with uh, with having a market trader selling the same stuff as, as a retailer. Um, I think that was it, Chair. Excellent, Councillor Dodd. I'll be brief, Chair. Sorry, Brian. Um, I'm just looking at rates of wear maintenance. I've had a, uh, I'm enjoying the break from ch chainsawing trees up. Uh, I think you might need to revisit that budget, considering you know I've seen around just on my patch, Belsey Estate, some you know woods of fifty percent gone. You know they've come down like a pack of cards. I don't know what the impact will be on rights of way, and I would imagine it's well down the list because there's priorities like roads and electric restoration. So I, I think that is, this could be a potential headache in the future because there'll, there'll be a whole load blocked. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I, I think you're absolutely right. It will be in that sort of second tier of priorities once all of the, the more heavily visited areas and used areas are, are tackled. But it will be a, a huge body of work to do. Right. Nick. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I've got a few quick questions. Um, you said that, um, and, and thanks for the uh, report, uh, Greg. 
You said that 68% uh, of uh, waste taken to household waste recovery centres is recycled. Just wondering if you knew how much of that was then rejected at the, um, at the uh, recycling centre and went for waste per energy. Yeah, so the... Oh, so. Shall I ask my others as well? Uh, I'd, I'd be very keen to know where the composting facilities and the, and the active landfill sites are. Um, I was hoping you could explain what a NEAT team is, because I'm, I'm not aware. And the last question was, um, it says under service plan priorities um, that you'll be baselining the carbon footprint of the waste service. Has that not already been done as part of um, the, the climate change team's work? Greg? Yeah, OK. So in, in terms of how much of the recycler is rejected from the, um, the household waste centres, um, almost none, because the uh, attendants on site are able to observe if something's been put in the wrong container and can quite often move it and put it in the right container. Uh, we, we have far bigger issues with contamination on our um, curbside collections, so what people are putting in their dry recycler wheelie bin. Uh, so we, we do have a higher contamination rate on those and I think it's running above 13 percent at the moment as, as a sort of c contractual rate that we, we agree with it, with Suez when they process it um, but what how that tends to manifest itself in rejected loads is that um, if there's a small amount of con uh, contamination in, in a load then the process is designed to pick that out and we have manual pickers at the beginning of the process to take out any sort of obvious horrible nasties if you like um, but if if a load is so grossly contaminated by food or nappies or, or anything of that nature uh, when it arrives at the tip face then the whole load has to be rejected uh, so as well as that being a, a negative <coughs> impact on the, you know what we're recycling that also then costs us about an extra thousand pounds to process that load and take it down to be burnt for for energy so uh, so Getting on top of contamination in dry recycling bins is, is a key issue for us and something we have campaigns on and, and target it to those areas where we're, we're having problems. Uh, in terms of, of landfills and, and composting facilities, I'll, I'll get a list of the composting facilities to you. I think there's two at the moment that we're using, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head where they are because they do change. Uh, but the only landfill we use is, uh, is Ellington. Um, and in fact, at the moment, um, some waste from the southeast is having to go there because there's no electricity at the um, tipping point uh, at West Sleepburn. Uh, it seems that the whole industrial estate has electricity apart from Suez site where we take our, our waste and our recycling processing plant uh, has no electricity down there either. So, uh, so we're having to, to stockpile that dry <laughs> recycler at the moment. Obviously, we don't want to go landfilling that. Yeah. Okay, is that all right? Um, the NEAT team and the yeah. carbon Sorry, I didn't write those down and yeah. I've got a head like a sieve. Um, so the, the NEAT team that um, is the, um, the street cleansing and grounds maintenance teams, we sort of give an overarching title of NEAT teams too. So anybody involved in grounds maintenance and street cleansing and public convenience cleansing, um, we call our NEAT teams. But it stands for something, I think. It does, what... and I knew somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> it's, uh, neighbourhood, it starts Neighbourhood with... Environmental Action Teams. <laughs> Got there in the end. I'd, uh, yeah, I'd have, I'd have felt silly if I'd have failed that test. Uh, in terms of the baseline, I think the, uh, the overall baseline in activity that went on um, at the beginning of the declaring a, um, a climate emergency was obviously a fairly high level assessment of, of what the county council's carbon emissions had been. Uh, what we really want to get into now is, is the specifics of individual service areas and the reason that we're prioritising the, the waste one is because of all of these changes that are coming down the line so not only do we want to be able to assess uh, the positive impact that has on uh, our recycling rates uh, we want to be able to also measure the financial and environmental costs of running all these additional services and see whether there's a net gain which hopefully there will be government will be sensible enough to to parcel it up in a way that delivers that Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, I've just Chair, got... Chair, can I just come yeah, back on one can. point? And it was a point that Nick made, made there about, um, you know, if you've got contamination within 
uh, a wagon that's coming <coughs> to the disposal points. Um, have we ever warned or fined or cautioned anybody in respect of putting the raw material in? And if we have, why don't we publicise it to get a message out there that it can't be tolerated? So we have never fined anybody, uh, I think is, a, is an answer to that question, but we have a process in place where there are uh, warnings issued. So the first thing that would happen if we're aware there's contamination in a certain bin is to put like a red tag on the handle, which tells people their bin's contaminated, please take that out and then we'll come back and empty it next time. Um, for persistent offenders, we then have some standard letter templates that we, that our recycling officers would send out to that household. And then ultimately, which we haven't had to do very often, fortunately, but we have done, we will take that bin away from them um, and, uh, and stop providing that service because of the impact that it has. Um, and that if they've got any recycling, they'd have to take it to the HWRC, but they're very rare that we have to get that far. Okay. Right, just a couple of things I had. Um, first of all, just a tiny nitpicky thing, as you would imagine, coming from me. And the photograph of the fountains is actually Ridley, Ridley Park. Park. Oh, is it? It's, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I don't think they're actually um, a shining example of the, 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 the services we provide. So if you're going to show this somewhere else, I would put another illustration in there because they're, they're a nightmare. Uh, second, um, a few years ago, um, we did close the, the the rural recycling things if you remember it was seven day like the urban ones it's now reduced to three I was just wondering what the whether we feel that's impacted or no, people just used to it now is there a, in a perfect world would you go back to seven days um, then the electric vehicles <laughs> Obviously, the, there's, a, there's a lot more maintenance on, a, an elect, on a petrol or diesel powered vehicle than an electric vehicle. And I was just wondering how we're going to keep them maintained. Are we, tra are we retraining our mechanics? Are we, and um, with Northumberland with vast parts of Northumberland not having any power, it, it would really impact on our fleet if we couldn't charge them. And I don't think the, 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 the storm we had over the weekend, I don't think it's going to be the last we have. And it's really shown up, this, it's really shown up the grid not to, <laughs> not to be up to scratch. So I was just wondering whether we need to start thinking about what alternatives we would have if our depots were out of juice would we have to start you know a, a diesel generator which kind of cancels it out and the and the probably the last thing about the income um i can't find it now but does that include um the money we get from the town councils and the agreements we've got to cut the grass and empty the bins and and clean various things. Uh, and sorry, the last thing I've just seen. <coughs> you did mention the tree and woodland policy that I think is probably out of date now. I think it was 2019 it should have been done. Um, I would like to think that that would come here, Sean, pre-scrutiny. Let's try and help you with it rather than it turn up and for us to say, oh, because as you know, quite a few of us have got problems with trees. But, but it is quite funny that in my division, all the trees that people complain about are all still there. <laughs> and all the ones everybody's happy, happy with are gone. So I don't know what that says. But anyway, if you could answer those things, and then I think it'll be time to move on. Yeah, I suppose first, thank you for pointing out my uh, horrendous schoolboy error with three esteemed councillors from Blythe in the room that know that park inside out. And uh, yes. Well, no, 
but I think uh, you're right to point out, but yes, we, we have two water play features in the county. One is the one in the picture in Ridley Park that's been in place for a very long time. And what I should have said is, and the other one um, is in Ashington in Hurst Park, which was part of the, the recent multi-million pound uh, renovation. So uh, I usually do at least one thing to make myself look silly every single day. That's uh, today's out of the way. So thank you. Um, so in terms of the uh, HWRCs, we um, only reduce the hours on those four sites where we got, relatively speaking, very low volumes of, of rubbish. Um, so they're, they're facilities that, that don't get an awful lot of traffic and a lot of volume coming through them. But if we were to the remove those facilities, obviously, then the distances people would have to travel would be significant. So we still get the same volumes through those sites on four days a week than seven. So no, I don't think I would go back because it, it wouldn't be value for money. Um, in terms of electric vehicles and maintaining them yes we've um, sent uh, a, a number of our fitters on specialist courses now because having to make sure that they're properly isolated before you recover them if they do break down uh, is quite a serious issue because of the high sort of voltage that uh, that can come through so yeah we're tra training our own staff up to maintain those vehicles going forward uh, in terms of future charging i think we're we're lucky insofar as even when we um, electrify the majority of our small vans. The larger vans and the, the uh, o license fleet above three and a half tonne, we're still some way off from having really viable electric alternatives for those. So I think we'll always, you know, certainly for the next five to seven years, we'll have the resilience within the service to cope with that if, if a depot can't charge their vehicles up. And we've got very good um, contacts with all the hire companies so we could get things in quickly if there was an emergency. But it is something to build into our business continuity plans that we haven't yet. So good point, well made. Uh, the income does include the income we receive from our neighbourhood services partnerships from, from town and parishes, um, but there's a corresponding cost in the budget as part of the, uh, the expenditure because um, that's the way that those work. And in terms of Train Woodlands policy, obviously, yes, I think that would be a good thing to, to bring to scrutiny. I think trees and, and woodlands are, are really interesting, especially trees in, in urban areas. We have people... That, polar opposite ends of the scale some people want it all chopped down so that they can uh, get better satellite signal or better light uh, other people will uh, will want to preserve a tree even if it's dangerous and, and not uh, do any work to it and striking a balance between those within the resource that we've got i think will be a challenge for the for the tree and woodland policy going forward and you know, from an officer's point of view I'd, I'd like to see strengthen what we will and what we won't do because we end up spending quite a lot of time talking to people about things that we know ultimately we won't do like you know undertake tree removal just to improve somebody's uh, satellite signal as an example uh, whereas at the moment we have a lot of conversations about that before we say no I'd quite like to strengthen it up so that we're clearer about what we can and what we can't do what we will and what we won't do excellent so if nick did you want to come back as long as it's quick yeah, it is quick. Could I, could I just ask quickly about West Sleekburn um, uh, Materials Recovery Centre? Um, you said that it's without electricity at the minute. Um, are they managing to stockpile all of the um, recycle, recycling material that comes in and are they going to be able to catch up with the recycling or have they had to divert material so, to energy from waste? So the way we split our, our collections in terms of residual waste and, and recycling waste is the, uh, the, the <coughs> southeast, the two southeast areas are always on an opposite collection cycle to the Castle Morpeth, the North and, and Tyndale. So at the, this week, the, um, the southeast area are collecting residual waste and that's going to landfill. Uh, the Castle Morpeth area that would normally tip at the West Sleepburn um, plant are taking their dry recycling material to Annick Transfer Station. Uh, and I think when they're doing Pontiel and collections today, they're running it over to Hexham Transfer Station. So at the moment, we're not losing any of that dry recycling. We're just storing it in alternative transfer stations. Okay. But uh, that's... You know, that's quite a serious thing if we can't get power to it, so we need to be on it, don't we? Yeah. OK, excellent, thanks. If we're all finished with Greg, you can go and save the world now. Um, and I think Sarah, who has been very patient, is going to come and talk to us about the act of travel and road safety for the journey to school, which is pages 21 to 38.
my coffee my coffee's actually a cold. I have been tested, so don't don't all, don't all go and blaming me when you come down with COVID this afternoon, because it's not. Tested for what? <laughs> Do I really have to say, Richard? Right, so Sarah's going to talk to us about this. I think as far as I've been briefed, this was asked for by one of the councillors on the committee. So, you know, this is one of the things that we do. We do actually listen to what people want to talk about and try our best to provide the information required if, if the technology works. <laughs> Okay. So I think what this is, is I, we're going to have a, there's a little video in here as well, Sarah, is that right? That's right, yeah. Perfect. There's a little video in here as well, so it'll be about 10 minutes and then it will have an answer as many questions as you can manage to think of. Sarah, there we are, I've managed to pad it out. Thank you very right, much. off you go, Sarah. <laughs> First of all, I'd just like to ask if Councillor Riddle would like to say anything before I start the presentation. Um, well, I think Councillor Riddle would have to ask the chair before he oh, asked. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, I'm quite happy. Is it appropriate for you to say this now or after? Probably after, I think. Right, okay, there we go no then. You, you're the first in after Sarah's finished. <laughs> Okay then. Um, my name's Sarah Rowell. I'm a Principal Transport Officer and I have a short presentation but there is a report attached to the papers as well with a lot more information in. So as mentioned I was asked to provide an overview of activities delivered to support more people to walk and cycle for the school journey. Just as a bit of background, the current data shows us that 37% of pupils in Northumberland walk, 6% cycle or scoot, 6% park away from the school and walk the remainder of the journey. 20% um, use school transport or public transport and 30% travel to school by car and 2% of those actually car share. Just comparing this to national data, the National Travel Survey shows that 37 pupils across the country travel to school in a car. It should also be noted that active travel is not always possible and I think this is particularly relevant in a county like Northumberland. So I'm going to allow Allendale First School to make the introductions. I just have to change screens. I think 
as a parent, when I do the school run and I do the Chris Central thing, when he does it, it's actually beneficial for our mental health and it's good for our um, exercise and well-being as well. Uh, I think it's done a great deal for their mental health, being this active and healthy, and we certainly noticed the difference with the children. I think if any of the schools wanted to do something like this, I would thoroughly encourage it to get the children and the parents involved and the staff on board as well. It is a whole community initiative, really. You're actually spending time actively with the family. I mean, they, they come out of school at the end of the day and they're absolutely coated in mud and they just look like they've had a brilliant day. Well, we're going to have to do more washing to be great. I think it's brilliant to keep mental health, physical health. I think it's brilliant to the environment and it just promotes independence. Well, I think the words which have to be amazing because I feel lots of good things at once and that's the only way I can put it. I hope you enjoy that. I'll switch back to my presentation. So the video showed us that walking and cycling school has lots of benefits, both for the environment and personal benefits as well. So what does the authority do to support this? Um, the authority has a behaviour change project called Schools Go Smarter, um, where we work with schools across the county to promote sustainable travel. We do that, this by promoting both local national events and also gear the schools up to take ownership of transport issues and de deliver their own events. On this slide here, I've outlined a number of things that we do. We distribute a Schools Go Smarter newsletter that goes to every school in the county each term and shows best practice, offers advice. Um, we encourage schools to develop school travel plans and these both identify transport issues and develop strategies to address these issues and achieve modal shift towards more sustainable forms of travel. We also support a national accreditation scheme called Moorshit Stars and this allows schools to achieve regional and national accreditation and schools in Northumberland have been recognised through this scheme. We support events such as Walk to School Week, Walk to School Month, Bike Week and Walk Once a Week. And we deliver a range of activities for schools and children to take part in. During Walk to School Month in October this year, we had over 4,000 pupils taking part. We deliver ride leader training to school staff. Um, up to date, 38, 38 school staff have taken part. And this is a photo from the most recent training. And then we support the schools with a small grant that can be used to develop projects such as lead rides and bike clubs. <clears throat> we have two theatre and education productions which are delivered to secondary age children and these focus on road safety and sustainable travel. And we also deliver bikeability to schools and this is practical cycle training. And each year we celebrate the Schools Go Smarter project as part of the Love Northumberland Awards. And this year, Stanton First School and Allendale Primary School were the joint winners. We also develop park and stride schemes outside schools or five minute walking zones and encourage those parents who can't walk or cycle to school, can't use public transport, to maybe park away from the school and walk the last five minutes. In terms of planning requirements, if there's a significant change to the school, we request that schools develop a framework school travel plan. And this provides an on-site assessment of transport links, facilities, and outlines defined aims and objectives in relation to travel modes. Following this, a full school travel plan is required within six months of the school opening. And the school should receive bronze level mode shift accreditation by the end of the first year. So COVID's obviously impacted on our project and has impacted on school transport issues as well. And this has included how pupils have travelled to school. There's been some hesitancy around public transport and school transport and also issues around the school site and access related to social distancing. The Schools Go Smarter project supported schools throughout this time. We secured funding from the Department for Transport and made school grants and support available to school to address safety concerns and support schools to promote walking and cycling. We also delivered school streets as part of this programme. And this was to support social distancing. And I'll discuss this a little bit later on. So here we go. 
So I hope you agree that the Schools Go Smarter project offers a wide range of initiatives and it's set up so schools can choose which initiatives that they take part in and are appropriate to them. Feedback from schools shows that the service we provide meets their needs and they feel well supported. Schools have also expressed their thanks for the additional support we receive, they received during the COVID period. So road safety. So this is, we have a joint project with the Highways Pro Improvement Team and the Go Smarter team Go, called Go Smarter Safer Routes to School. And this aims to improve road safety and reduce traffic management issues experienced outside schools. As mentioned before, we also introduce school, treat, school streets where appropriate. And this is the introduction of where we close the roads outside the school at the start and end of the school day, residents are exempt, to allow pupils to walk and cycle and to spill out onto the pit, into the road and for there to be more space. To date, four schools have had school streets implemented. Road safety improvements are also introduced around schools where considered necessary, and this is done for the local transport capital local transport plan capital programme, and these can include pedestrian crossings, improvement in footways and cycleways, and the introduction of traffic regulation orders to reduce the conflict between vehicles and pedestrians. The council has also rolled out a programme of 20 mile an hour schemes outside schools, and 101 are in place at the moment. The council also provides road safety training to school children through the Curbcraft programme and also safety awareness through campaigns such as Be Bright, Be Seen. Also some schools attend Safety Works, which is in Newcastle, and it's an interactive train, training programme where the road safety training officer attends. So this is my final slide. So as well as working with schools, we also launched a public facing campaign during April of this year, the Big Newfoundland Gear Change. And this asks residents to think carefully about the journeys they take and consider swapping some car journeys for more sustainable forms of travel. The campaign features inspirational <coughs> stories and it's hoped that residents see themselves through these stories and feel motivated to make small changes to their lifestyles that can improve their physical, mental well-being and also the environment. Finally, we'll continue to seek funding for, for these initiatives, and this includes the DFT Walking and Cycling Capability Fund. So that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. I was first again. Thank you. Uh, obviously very supportive and good to hear what's going on and progressing. I have been involved personally in Safe Routes to School in Annick, uh, which has a big school, which has just changed location. And so the routes have been reprogrammed to, to meet the high schools, which have got 1,600 pupils, their requirements. One thing which is frustrating, and this is one you can't answer, but I think it's a question which I'm saying needs to be asked. Um, Councillor Kenz and I, 10 years ago, tried to get a crossing at a very key point at the school. It's so difficult. Why is it so difficult to get a crossing? Now, it should be easier than it has proved to be. We had a, a, a site visit of an officer who's no longer with us outside the um, Roman Catholic School on South Road. Yes, was a crossing needed here. That was five years ago. Now, if we go to Spain and Portugal to give an example, every town Every village virtually has a crossing point almost every 100 metres. And that, whilst that's too much to ask right now, I think that's the direction we should be moving in, making it easier to get crossings. And it's much too difficult and much too expensive. It's going to take four weeks to put the crossing where at last it's going allegedly, but it's been deferred three times outside one of the major routes to the high school along Victoria Terrace at Annick. And I just think it's too difficult. And I do think we need to press this one a little further, uh, harder than we have done. Thank you, Chair. Well, I shall come on a march with you any time you like, Councillor <laughs> Castle. Councillor Morford. Thank you. Um, thanks for the uh, report and the presentation, Sarah, and thanks for all the work that you're doing. The, the report um, says that the 16 uh, Walk Once a Week initiatives uh, last year increased school active travel by 4%. And that made me wonder um, how much data we have uh, to show the overall effectiveness of the Schools Go Smarter and the Safer Routes to School programmes. Um, how effective they are at increasing school active travel and reducing car use. It also made me wonder uh, what trends the school travel survey and the mode shift stars data have shown over the years um, and whether those trends can help us to assess the effective effectiveness of 
the schools go smarter and the safer routes to school programmes um, and help us decide if we're doing enough to promote school active travel. Okay, um, so we have a couple of different data sources. So schools who join up to mode shift stars, they have to start doing at least annual act, um, travel surveys with their school, if not twice a year. Um, and as they develop through the accreditation, they have to start to show that they achieve modal shift away from what towards more sustainable modes of travel. So the schools we have got accreditation, we have good data sources for that. And also the ones with a higher accreditation show that they are achieving modal shift. In terms of the, the rest of the county, we do an annual hands up survey with schools, but we have this is a voluntary data collection. Um, and so not all schools take part every year and we have a bit of a mis mis mismatched, you know, landscape in terms of data. And it generally shows across the county we remain steady each year um, rather than, you know, things changing. OK. Uh, yeah, thank you. Would it be possible to see the, uh, the data from the mode shift stars and the travel service? Um, yeah, it, it is available. Um, yes, I can forward it on to you. The Thank mode shift star is slightly different because that's school related data. So um, it would be easier if it was a particular school you were interested in, we could put it out. Or do you just want to have a general feel of it? It was a general feel that I was after. Right, OK, that's fine. I can. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. that's no problem. OK, um, could you share that with all, all of us? Because yeah. that seems right. Um, so I've got Councillor Gallagher, then Councillor Hardy. <laughs> um, Thank you, Chair. Um, Maybe to make a point, I'm, I'm sure that we had a, a scrutiny meeting and the chair might remember this, where the council are working towards a Northumberland schools plan. And the reason for that, if I remember rightly, was that everybody had seemed to have the same issues around the area and we seemed to be doing it singularly rather than a, a, a group. And I think that, that was something that the council was going to pick up on. And I'm not sure where that is. But... Um, Sarah, thanks for the presentation. And, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And I'm speaking from a councillor from the southeast part of Northumberland. And, and it's great to see, you know, you, you, the cycle tracks. And you, it seemed to be the, the place had a lot of space. And, and I, dare I say, a lot of respect for, for the travel back and forth to school. Um, the problems I've got is, uh, are, I should say, there's a few. Um, it's like... King Canute watching the tide coming in all the time on a, on a regular cycle of school intakes. We have to educate the, the parents about where the park, how the park, and be respectful. And that normally takes half the way through. <coughs> and I just didn't know how you connected with schools, you know, um, to educate the, the, the parents before they start educating the, the, the children. Uh, you mentioned about cycle tracks. Same again, Bly. Not so much Cramlin because they've they've had a lot of money spent on cycle tracks. Ashington, we put cycle tracks in that fit in the area. They're not always the best thing, but they fit in, and they're not always the safest thing. So they're just trying to fit in. So that there's that there. Then um, you mentioned something about small grants are available to schools. Can I tell you every elected member in Northumberland has a small member schemes, and they want to help and make sure the kids and our, and our wards are safe. So there's a route that maybe, if allowed <coughs> through the business chair of Northumberland County Council, that we could actually put a little bit money into schemes because we, we are kind of limited with that, but that's something to look at. Um, you mentioned about, same again, coming back to parents. You know, how, how do you work with the parents and when do you work with them? So they need to be... Same again, coming back to that point about education before the, the new term, term starts. The 20 mile an hour schemes. I've just um, done a, a fair chunk of 20 mile an hour schemes around the schools in Ashington, um, the James Nutt, which is an academy school. And I'm, I've got to say it on record, I want to thank the highways department for all the work and the effort that they've done with that. But we've got to all be mindful. These are just advisory 20 mile an hour so if, if somebody wants to go along there at 40 mile an hour they're not going to get fined <laughs> so the reality is maybe a shift in policy through this council that says actually it's 20 mile an hour through that scheme and if you're going through any faster than that you're going to get fined but the way it was left to me was people wouldn't the kids 
going to school is a paramount thing. It's really a safe. We need to give that safe environment and work around it. So again, you know, thank you very much for, for the presentation, but I still have a lot of concerns. So thank you. Yes, uh, my concern is about the 20 mile an hour speed limits outside schools. I've got three schools in my division that don't have restrictions and I've been in contact um, to try and get them put through on a local traffic plan and I've also offered funding from the small schemes allowance but my concern is one of the schools is on a main road uh, doesn't have a crossing point um, it's on a diversionary route for one the A1 is closed and it seems to go along at a snail space to try and get these things implemented so I would like to see a spotlight put on 20 mile an hour restrictions outside schools in the Norham and Islandshire division. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's probably way above Sarah's pay grade, actually. Yeah, but um, yeah, me. so um, I, I, I do apologise, Councillor Riddle. I completely forgot you were here. <laughs> because, because what my agenda says is that you're Colin Horncastle, but hey, you know, what do you know? So sorry, John, carry on. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, you know, thanks, Sarah, for the presentation and, and the work she does. Um, on the 20 mile an hour speed limits uh, around schools, I have asked that to be uh, accelerated and rolled out as quick as we can to the other schools where we can actually do it. Because there are some that where it's not deemed by officers to be appropriate to read the regs. But I've asked for that to be speeded up. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, 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 speed it up. The programme, the programme speed it up, yes, yes. We do actually also have a, a, a vehicle that's equipped with a, with a camera if we have problems that can be deployed at, at schools. And, you know, I think actually that list, I forget what you called it, Sarah, but the list really of everything that we can offer to schools, the plan, is very extensive. And, you know, it was great to see the... Uh, the two schools being represented at the Love Northumberland Awards, etc. That was very good. Uh, and the enthusiasm. And, you know, I think the other thing is that after a mobile phone, these scooter things are the next thing that the kids want now at the moment. So I think we're going to see more and more of those. Having said that, you know, because of the uh, geography of the county, etc., you know, I think there's a limit to what is uh, reasonable here. And we've got to accept that. But, you know... To me, it's a bit of the old adage. I think, you know, we're doing an awful lot and, you, and it depends on also the attitude of the, the head teacher and the governing bodies of the schools, the local management of schools, as to how, how far this actually gets pushed at school level. And I see Sarah nodding there. And, you know, to me, the old saying of you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it to drink is very appropriate here. Yeah. Excellent. Anyone anyone else? Thanks for that, John. Councillor Castle. Yeah, make a comment on 20 mile speed limits. This is this is an experience of mine uh, in my own town, and I'm sure it's the case. I've yet to hear of any person in North London ever prosecuted for exceeding a 20 limit. And the reason is that the police don't and won't enforce them. They're all advisory. And we actually wrote to the police commissioner and didn't get a reply, didn't get an answer as to why this is the case. So I think it's a matter that probably should be taken further. They are all advisory, which actually makes them, weakens their significance to a great extent. I'll just make that comment. Well, now the whole world knows our uh, faults. Right, <coughs> Councillor Morford. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask whether enough is being done to encourage the children who live too far from school to walk or cycle to get more exercise. Um, so you, you said the school travel survey uh, shows that 50% of school children in the county get uh, driven to school in uh, bus or car. Um, national data shows that 82% of children in England don't get enough uh, exercise each day. Um, and there's some great statistics on page 24 of the report, but when you take into account that there's 163 schools in Northumberland, you can see how many schools haven't signed up to these initiatives. 
Um, I've, I've spoken to schools in rural areas who tell me that the, um, the children who do live close enough to walk or cycle already do that, and there's nothing they can do to get the other children walking and cycling. But after reading this report, I can see how much could be done. Um, so it just makes me wonder whether we're doing enough to engage those um, schools and those children who uh, aren't getting enough exercise. Before Sarah does, uh, before Sarah makes a comment, um, Rob would like to interject. Yeah, can I come in on the, on yeah, the last could, point? Could you, could you, sorry, Rob, could you just indicate yeah. everybody who you actually are? Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's not just some random person that's going <laughs> to. Hello, uh, Rob Murphy. Uh, I'm the interim executive director for both local services and for planning. Uh, a theme that's come across in several of the points made by members is about, I would, what I would summarise is that some schools are really involved in this and actually some aren't and some may be resistant. And I had the phrase about taking a horse to water. Uh, what's been taking place that was mentioned in the presentation over the last few years is that every time we have the opportunity where a school is extended or changes or is indeed built, we take that opportunity to make the formal requirement that they have to go into through the uh, travel planning process and they are supported on that. Uh, and as well, at the time we make the decision about to extend or build a new school, we have to make a very careful call as members here who have been on planning committees will know that there can be arguments for having as much car parking on site as possible to reduce the impact of parking problems in nearby streets but at the same time by having too much parking provision it pulls in the opposite direction because it makes the use of the car too attractive and and works against modal shift so these are matters that have to be carefully balanced but i'd just like to uh, reaffirm that we use every opportunity we do uh, with the school travel team to lever in the requirement for school travel plans to all schools, as, and we are working our way through all schools. So hopefully, by some point, all schools will be covered by some form of uh, arrangements. Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you want to comment on that or say anything more? Or I just wanted to come back on Nick's comment regarding yeah. rural schools. Um, we do try with all the initiatives that we um, promote to make them adaptable for those kids who can't walk and cycle for the school journey so they can take part within the school grounds. But obviously it's up to the school if they take part or not. So we have kids walking on the playgrounds, you know, possibly using school bikes to have a go at a bike within the school grounds. Okay, thanks for that, Sarah. That was very interesting and, and very informative. Um, <coughs> Councillor Richardson. Can I ask, is the teacher going like? to be cycling to school as well then because when you're on about car parking mainly it's teachers cars that are in that car park so i was just wondering if teachers are taking that as well cycling to school the school travel plan does cover staff as well um, obviously we can't enforce teachers to cycle school to school but we do ensure that the school travel plan covers anybody who uses the school site I'll, I'll get this stopped in a second, I promise you. Councillor Gallagher. Just very, very quickly, I think that's a valid point because on Warren's Bait Road in Ashington, and I don't want a specific any particular school or area, but it was highlighted, we did a bit of research in there about the parking, and we found that 20 of the cars that were there were from members of staff. And what happens is everybody thinks everybody's working an eight to five, but some people are just coming in part-time, mm -hmm. teach, teachers, kitchen assistants and everything. So, I think that that would help a lot. And I draw great concerns that from the portfolio holder and yourself of the connection with the schools. So I think that's maybe something that we as a council need to work on a little bit more because if there are grants and if there is money, there's a, a door that we can open for them to, to work with us and understand our concerns. So thank you for that, Jan. Apologies. <laughs> I'm trying my best, but go on. Councillor Morford. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, you only have to visit schools such as the new Hexham Academies at opening or closing time to see that behavioural change initiatives on their own aren't enough to create the changes we want to see if the surrounding roads are dangerous to children. 
and you tend to get a vicious circle where parents are too scared to let their children walk or cycle, so they drive them instead, which makes it more dangerous for everyone else. And we need to make that vicious circle into a virtuous circle by challenging the dominance of the motor vehicle. As well as creating better walking and cycling infrastructure, we have to create more school streets and park and stride schemes. So it's great to see we've got four school streets already and might soon have eight, that's fantastic. The report doesn't say how many Northumberland schools have park and stride schemes though, I'd really like to know. Um, and then finally, I'd like to know whether more could be done to encourage more of our schools to create park and stride schemes and whether more could be done to speed up the rollout of school streets. Well, I don't think there's anything Sarah can really say about that other than know what you've said. And if you want that specific information, then I suggest you email her rather than, because I shall not have that off, you don't have that off the top of your head, do you? I don't have numbers, no. Yeah, well, there we are. So that, let's do that. Um, so I'll just draw this to a close by, by saying that my son um, is a teacher, not in Northumberland, but if he didn't have a car, there isn't any way that he could get to the rural school he works in, in Lancashire. It's just absolutely, you know, there's no bus, there's no train, and he certainly couldn't cycle the 35 miles, you know, to get there on time with all the kit he's got to take. But anyway, the, these are problems, you know, and we just have to keep trying to find solutions. So thanks for that, Sarah, that was very good. Um, I think everybody's had a good go at that, so we shall, we shall now move on, um, and we have the Communities in Place Overview and Scrutiny Committee Work Programme and Monitoring Report. And I'm sure Sean is going to be delighted to guide us through this, is that right? Delighted, Chair. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so, we have a, a, a meeting scheduled for the end of uh, this month. That was purely put in the timetable in case there was any pre-scrutiny that you wanted to look at. There isn't, so we intend to to cancel uh, or just delete that from the programme chair. Um, the January meeting, um, the uh, fire and rescue, we will have an overview, but also um, to look at the the inspectors' report on the the, the service. That re that report won't be received by the council until the fifteenth of December, so there's no way Paul will be able to turn a report round. Uh, for the January meeting, so so that will be deferred to February. Uh, so currently, the only item you've got for January is the uh, the customer complaints uh, report. Um, and of course, the knocking effect of that is that the February meeting will be perhaps busier than we would have liked. Um, but obviously, you as the new chair, we need to have a conversation about the priorities of the of the work programme going forward and. It may well be that we we will just defer, we will deal with items that are on the programme, but we just might sort of space them out a little bit more as, as we go forward. Uh, but again, the, the usual plea that if uh, if any members have any issues that they want to add to the work programme, there were a couple of issues rising from Greg's presentation this morning that, that may well, um, after, after consultation, uh, be added to the programme later on. Okay, um, what I would like to add to that um, would be, I think, having weathered the storm, as it were, I think we should perhaps have a report, you know, a, de a debrief from officers about, you know, what we had to do, what we had to divert, how much it's cost us, and that sort of thing. And, and I think, if at all possible, we should try and get... Uh, the northern grid here to explain to us how they can't keep the lights on everywhere. I mean, it's not, you know, as it is within our remit, isn't it? I mean, it does affect, it does affect quite a lot of us. I, I you know, I don't think it's, to be honest, I don't think it's acceptable that people are you know, going to be off for more than a week, <clears throat> especially when we're becoming more and more reliant on electricity. So, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly in, in the remit of the, of the committee to um, invite external partners two meetings uh, but what we do in those instances we have a sort of a double hander where we have a presentation from our own officers yeah, yeah. and then and then that, that that other outside agency will, will answer so the, answer the are we all right if we did that is happy with that are we um and also i would, I would really like to see the tree and woodland thing yes, come to us because that, that yeah. you know 
well, if we've got any trees left to manage, that is. Um, Councillor Morfitt and then Rob. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just want to say I'm totally with you on that. I think we need to look at um, Northern Power Grid's ability to keep the lights on um, and also look at the Council's own um, storm response as well. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. If you put your microphone on, I'll let you, yeah. As, as a rural representative, uh, one of even more worrying to me than the fact that we didn't have electricity and some still haven't got it now is the fact that about 20 of the mobile phone masts were also down because they obviously don't have backup generators or whatever, I don't know. But, yeah, yeah. you know, the fact that no power but no means of communicating, no internet, no mobile signal, etc., is, right, is so also important. Could we open reach as well? Is that something we can do? <clears throat> yeah, we, we, we do have a presentation going to um, corporate services on Monday about the, um, the the monies that were allocated from the North of Tyne um, for uh, broadband development in the county. And it may well be that... It's not really the broadband development. It's, no, no, it's the actual infrastructure is, failing, I think, is what we're, what yeah. we're worried about. But if I, if I can, when we have the briefing on Monday, perhaps I could introduce that into, into the briefing and perhaps get yep. from, from that a, a further report later on. OK, yeah, Rob, sorry about that. Go on. Yeah, uh, Chair, uh, if I can make a suggestion in that uh, the County Council's been... Uh, acting on a very wide number of fronts in terms of the emergency both in terms of care homes, you know, water supplies, you know, across the piece. And maybe it would be worth looking at uh, how well our contingency plans have worked, because I would say uh, on the whole they've worked very well. But then to follow that up, maybe a similar question about the contingency plans of certain mm -hmm. other yeah. organisations could be looked at. And, and given the sheer scale of the activities of the County Council, uh, I do think that the session on our contingencies is worth one session and then the external yeah. parties are not a, a separate day. Okay, then yeah. can uh, we... Sorry, sorry, I can just... Yeah, I meant to say as well that, that we're working closely with NPG at the moment uh, and it looks like their response activities will be taking place right through to the new year. So once, once things are back to normal, then we could look at this. Yeah, so, uh, it, well, yeah, as soon, as soon as possible, when we're all back and running, I think, is shown as, as what we're... Yeah. Well, I mean, just, just goes back to what I was saying. We've, we've got a, you've got a very full programme yeah. in February and March, and it's a case of moving things around. Yeah, we, well, I we, think... We, I can think this, that, we can have that conversation. Yeah. I think doing that is... You know, doing <coughs> yeah. doing a, a debrief on all of this is probably more yeah, worth our while yeah. than... Yeah. 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 Councillor Dodd and Councillor Morford. Yeah, um... This is all probably taking us by surprise. We always have the winter readiness for the roads and all that. I think, like all of us, we probably didn't have enough candles, we didn't have enough paraffin, we weren't quite prepared for this. I mean, I've got a little generator, but that's going to get upgraded to a bigger one uh, when, I, you know, when, when, when they're all back on the shelf in the shops. But this is really taking a lot of people by surprise. A lot of the rural areas are used to this sort of power missing for a couple of days but this is now starting to go on a bit yeah, yeah. and it doesn't look like it, it's going to come back and the 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 systems you know what i get my ear bent you know you get one street in pont or two streets in pontyland off altogether certain areas are off they've got no communication they ain't got a phone now you everybody we're all guilty we're used to this mobile phone but when that dies you sort of die with it uh, you know, I've had to rescue Councillor Veronica Jones with a generator last night and she's been off, she can't, got no communication, something fell on her car, she's got no car. Wow. And, and that would be the same story all over. So I think we, we probably need to do a house reality check at some point, because if this happens again, and if, if it, it does will. happen again, it probably will happen again, we need to be having a little bit more prepared because it's not just that, as you say, the mobile phone electric masts that fall down i mean we hear of water pumps not being pumping water because of electric uh we probably do need a little bit of thought on all of this probably cross scrutiny you know all the other well, ones that scrutiny is always cross richard no you're just bad tempered <laughs> i'll leave it at that excellent well no all of that's noted richard yes 
Thank you. Um, I got um, emails from the County Council over the weekend with updates, but they didn't refer to um, any problems in my ward. Um, and then when I got the emergency email address, um, I, I sent an email ask, <clears throat> asking for an update on my ward on Monday night, but I haven't had a reply yet, and I'm still in the dark on that. Uh, I'm just wondering, I'd like to find out how I can get an update on my ward um, before I leave <laughs> County yeah. today. Yeah. There's the man, probably. Yeah. Uh, we are just preparing some uh, additional comms information as we speak, uh, because, because there's the message that needs to go out as well is that where people are having problems, they need to use uh, certain email addresses or contact points or phone numbers and we'll be distributing them. We are now moving into what I'll call the immediate aftermath emergency still. So for example, uh, when, I'll give one example from local services, now when uh, waste collection vehicles are going around places that may have suffered power problems, they will check for vulnerable people if they have problems. So we, and we are working with both the police, the post office, and a wide range of bodies just to check that we are picking up and identifying the issues. Because the problem with this incident, and that's overwhelmed NPG, I think it's fair to say, is that their systems didn't quickly enable them to even understand the extent of the number of problems that have been experienced. So we've been, we've been very active in bringing their attention to the problems. But there are, there are some more com comms coming out today and following the, and later on this week on, on, the, on the issues you raised. Oh, OK. So, yeah, if you just... Just, just to say, because I have obviously been involved myself because we had communications and power uh, in parts of my ward, which never, never failed. Um, but my understanding from Northern Power Grid is just because the power's back on does not mean the problem's solved. That some of these repairs are temporary repairs yeah. and they're not permanent. And they're saying that this will take them all year at the oh, very yeah. earliest to sort out. We have to be realistic about what's going to... There are, there are pylons down everywhere and temporary circuits put in to, and some of the pylons look as though King Kong's crushed them. They're in such a state. So this has been a remarkable attack on the, on the power supply and many of these uh, present um, power back on situations are frankly temporary repairs so we have to be realistic about it well let's hope we can get somebody to come and talk to us about all that right excellent um so before we move to the part two the other thing i wanted to just say was uh, my intention would be to move the time of this meeting from the ridiculously early 10 o'clock to a far more respectable two o'clock um partly to help those with longer journeys i mean some of you lot will have got up early you know, especially, you know, you've come down, you know, so, um, well, I don't really, apparently it's within my power, so I can't just do it, so I have, but I thought it would be better just to, better just to tell you, in a nice fashion, rather than you turn up at 10 o'clock and have to wait for four hours. No, no, it's not, it's... The only thing is, Jeff, as well, if you do that, try and sort something out with the heating in here, it's absolutely freezing. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know whether that's within... Is that within my power, Sean? I think the thermostat's over there. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes, it, but it is cold. Right, so, so if we're all accepting of that, that's fantastic. So um, if we could stop the live recording now, please, we're going to go into part two. Um, just just it, for, for confirmation...